We're reading from Matthew 5, verses 17 to 20. So if you've got your Bibles, you probably can't read them anyway because of the light, but I'll read it for you. And uh, God's word is perfect. Teaching about the law. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to fulfill them. I assure you, until heaven and earth disappear, even the smallest detail of God's law will remain until its purpose is achieved. So if you break the smallest commandment, and teach others to do the same, you will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. But, I love it when the Bible says but, because there's a good message afterwards always. But, I warn you, unless you obey God better than the teachers of religious law, and the Pharisees do, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven at all. Mm, think about that. Matt will enlighten us. Like that. We love you, brother. <laughs> I don't like this at all. Now, I'll have to move this a bit. I'll walk around a lot. Uh, just in case, I know we... Oh, that was a good timing to drop that. Just so people that might be new here, if you're wondering where the toilets are and you haven't seen them, toilets are just right over there if anyone needs to use them. Just thought I, point, I would point that out because I was like, hey, we haven't told anyone about the toilets. And I don't know about anyone else. That's how I judge every place I go to, even as a kid. I'd use the toilet. If it has a good toilet, I'll come back. If it has a dodgy toilet, I don't think I'm coming back. So now that we got the toilet stuff out of the way, I did, see? There you go. (laughs) Now, uh, that's an interesting verse, isn't it? It, we, We don't tend to expect to read something like that. When we think of Jesus, when we think of Jesus, we kind of have a viewpoint of Christ that's more, I guess, aligned with Paul's letters and epistles with Mark and John and Luke. And in these gospels, you get this God who's all about grace, all about grace. But then Matthew, you get this different painting from those verses. And we find this passage near the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount which is a chunk of really important teaching. And Jesus here is shown as a Torah-loving teacher who is just as passionate about the law as the Pharisees. Which I don't know about anyone else. I can be honest to say that I don't think I think of Jesus that way sometimes. So that verse catches me by surprise. Even when you read the verse, he's not really painting the Pharisees in a bad light. He's not trying to say something negative to them. He's talking about how they, you know, adhere and try to do all these things. And it's just weird to have this passage and to view Jesus in this way. And it makes me think, what do we do with this passage that at first glance really appears to throw us a curveball? Seems to move away from God's grace a bit. Seems to be a little bit about the law, something we're not really used to. So what do we do with it? Do we just skip over it and act like it's not there? Go to another verse that we like. Uh, I know if we're honest, I'm sure all of us as Christians have done that at times. You read a verse and you're like, oh, that one doesn't sit with me. Let me just, you know, let me go to one of my faves. We'll just, I don't remember that one. That one's not important. But I don't think we can do that with this passage. So today, I want to dive a bit deeper into the text and look at the context around it to discover what this passage is trying to show us about embracing the gospel of Christ. So first thing we're going to look at is context around the gospel of Matthew. And there's lots of context I could share, but that would bore people and probably only make me feel like I'm smart or something, which I'm not. 
So we're not going to waste time in that. I just want to share two things, two important things that I think it's important to know about the Gospel of Matthew when looking at this passage. The first one is Matthew's Gospel was written after Paul's letters. We don't think of that when we open up our New Testament, right? You open it up, what do you have first? The Gospels. Then you have the Epistles. But that wasn't how the Bible was put together. When the Bible was going around and these letters were being written and passed around, it was the other way. Paul's letters were probably the first letters to spread around. And these letters created some tension for Matthew's community. Matthew's community that he's writing to is trying to find their place in the synagogue, trying to figure out what it looks like. Because Christianity is still a part of Judaism. It's just another sect of Judaism in a sense. And they're trying to figure it out. And Paul's letters kind of create some tension. And it leads to some early Christians being persecuted by the Jews who remained faithful to the synagogue and the Pharisaic leadership. And that was one tension they struggled with because of Paul's letters. Another one was they were asking real questions of, all right, what's the point of the law? Why do I have to keep it? I mean, I think that's a fair question. If you have all these Gentile believers and some guy saying, oh, they don't have to worry about it, and then you're still having to worry about it, it'd be like, oh, come on. Why do I have to do that? What's the point? So they're asking some real questions, trying to figure it out, trying to figure out if the grace of God is in the law. Matthew is trying to show how Jesus was passionate about the law, which reveals the will of God for humankind. So that's why Matthew kind of writes this letter a bit different than some of the other letters that we get and stories that we get in the Bible. He's trying to paint this picture because his community is kind of in the middle of Judaism still. They're still trying to find their place in the synagogues. They're still trying to figure out how they go about their faith tradition now in following Christ. And then the second thing I think we need to remember. Oh, Oh, I must have messed up my slides. Look at me. That wasn't good. Yeah, I'll just tell you guys. The second thing we need to remember, I forgot to make one last night. Go me. Is that the Sermon on the Mount, that teaching that we hear, that didn't just happen once. Jesus didn't say that one time, and then that was it. So he didn't go up on the Sermon on the Mount where he gives this beautiful teaching and a big chunk of teaching to people, and then never spoke of it again. A lot of scholars agree, which is a weird, a weird thing to have scholars agree on anything, because they just like to disagree. They're kind of like politicians. They just like to argue about the Bible instead. So they can never agree. They always Oh, I agree, but I disagree ever so slightly. But most of them agree this wasn't the only time. This teaching that we find was kind of like Jesus' catchphrase or like go-to messages, you know, if he gets put on the spot. Like if you've been in church for a while and you get put on the spot to do communion all of a sudden, you have your go-to message, I'm sure. You know, like, oh, there's this scripture I really like. And yeah, I got a message that goes with that. I'll just pull it. These were kind of like that for Jesus. These are some powerful teachings that he gave often, over and over and over again. And it's important to know this context, because if we read the passage Keith read out at face value, we can get some really good things from it, but we can also get some misunderstandings. But I just want to read it again, and I'm reading from the NIV translation, and it says this, do not think That I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of pen, of a pen, will be any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
So one beautiful thing we get out of this, and this guy, I love this guy's last name. I found him when I was studying for something else at uni, and I was reading, you know, scholarly things. His name's Wazowski. Paul W. Wazowski. I just think of Monsters, Inc. The kid in me loves that name, Wazowski. But it reveals this one thing. If we take that, there's something really good that comes to us right off the page. We don't even have to dig deeper. Jesus shares with the Pharisees a love for the written word that reveals the will of God for humankind. That's an awesome thing to read that and get that chunk out of it. That's good. That's important for us to remember. But then I think there's some confusion, if we're honest. Because at face value, is Matthew saying that Paul and people like Paul, because, you know, Paul was teaching all about the grace of God and it's all about grace and there's not circumcision or uncircumcised. Is he saying Paul is going to be less than the kingdom of God? Because if we just take that at the verse at face value, that's kind of the sense we get. But we know if we dive deeper into scripture and go a bit further, that's not the case. But if we're not careful and we read verses like that at face value, we can walk away with some misunderstandings and we can become very legalistic. So with all this in mind, I want to look at another thing to kind of understand what Christ is meaning in this passage. And I want to look at the law in Christ. And we kind of pick up something I think Christ is trying to show us about the law when we read the next verses. So I want to read the next two verses right after this. So in your Bibles, if you read that section right after verse 21 and 22, we read this, which is just interesting to have these two things together. And this is what it says in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you sell not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the, to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. I mean, wow. Wow. That's an interesting thing to read next, because that's part of their law, you know, not to murder. But Jesus seems to take it a step further. Talks about anger. Talks about not being angry with people. And raka is just an Aramaic, oh, Aramaic word that means contempt. But I think it's important, because these next passages, I like to call it the but I say section. I was going to title this sermon the but sermon, but... Kim told me that would be inappropriate, but I'm still going to say it because I thought it was funny, but I like to call this the but section or the but I say, but Jesus is pointing to the heart of the law in this section of scripture from verses 21 all the way to verses 48. He seems to bring up all these laws and all these teachings people would know, and he goes, but I say. He talks about something they know, but then goes a bit deeper. He's introducing what fulfillment of the law looks like in the kingdom of heaven, which is going deeper to discover the heart of the law, the heart behind it, taking a different perspective. We go from a perfective view to an imperfective view. And if you don't know your uh, verbal aspects in English grammar, you're not alone. I didn't know until I started studying Greek and I learned this, so don't worry. But verbs are different aspects, which is weird. I didn't realize it until I studied and someone told me. But a perfective view in the verbal aspect of English grammar is kind of like a helicopter view, right? So that's reading it from the top down. I'm standing up, you know, looking down, looking over, seeing it all. An imperfective view is kind of like your movie view. It's like an invitation into the story. 
So instead of looking from above, you're stepping in. So an imperfective view of the law dives us into the law in a way that turns it into more than just words on a page, sending us on a mission to discover its heart. We discover with the passage we read earlier, Christ is showing us that God's love takes us on a trajectory where we must be willing to wrestle with the heart of the law. And towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, after this but I say section and a bunch of other stuff, because it's a big chunk of teaching. So it's around Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. We kind of get this, this hint of what Christ wants us to make kind of our focal point. When we're trying to think of the law and what to do with it and what's the heart of it, Christ says this in Matthew 7, verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And I know at first we read stuff like that. And we're kind of like, oh, that sounds easy. That's easy to do that. That just means you're, you know, you're disregarding what you feel or the, you know, the, the truths we need to stand up for, or whatever we might want to come up with. But I feel if we take this verse to heart and we try to discover the heart behind the law, and if we make it our balancing point when we're kind of trying to dissect it and figure it out, figure it out if we would like someone else to treat us that way. It's hard to do. Just a simple explanation is who in here has had a meaningful conversation with someone ever? Like a deep and meaningful? I know we probably have, right? Yeah. Have you ever had a deep and meaningful where you disagree with the person? I, yeah, yeah, I'm sure we all have. I have. How hard is it in that moment, knowing that Christ hears our cries, right? God hears us. He hears our complaints, our angers, our frustrations. And if we're called to treat others the same, then we got to hear their anger, frustration, the things we don't agree with in a way that doesn't shut them off. But that's hard to do, to sit with someone who's sharing something you don't agree with. That doesn't sit well for you. And letting them get done talking. Because a lot of times we can think that we're listening enough if we wait for them to finish a, a point and take a breath in a sentence. And then you jump in. You know, it's kind of like, oh, good thing Kim's not in here. But it's like me and Kim have uh, heated discussions sometimes. And sometimes we get in the habit of doing that. Probably more me than Kim. But I just, I wait for Kim to take that breath or, you know, to pause and boom. But what about this? And then I, then I go. And then she goes, you haven't listened to me. Yeah, I did. I heard what you said. But you didn't let me finish. It's hard to let someone finish. We can act like it's an easy thing to do, to have this imperfective view of the law that allows us to dive into it, allows us not to just disregard verses we don't agree with, but to try to figure out the heart of it. What's the heart behind this? What's the heart of God in this? What's the heart of God telling me to do in my here and now? That's a harder job to do. And that's what Jesus is suggesting. And it's way more challenging. He's not saying we can just disregard the law or anything we don't agree with in Scripture. Instead... He's wanting us to have an imperfective view that dives into the heart of the law to discover God's grace within. He's wanting us not to just take things at face value. That includes when it comes reading scripture or even when it comes me doing a sermon or anyone doing a sermon. We can take it back and wrestle with God about it. We can dive deeper to see what, what's the heart of God in that. 
not just taking what someone says or what we read at face value, but taking it back to God and trying to figure it out, trying to figure out the heart of it. And this way, honestly, gets your hands a bit more messier. Because you have to engage in stories more. We can't just sit up on our, you know, hilltop benches and tell people how bad or wrong they are. We have to get our hands a bit more messier. We have to listen. We have to engage with the world around us to see what God's telling us to do in our here and now. And we always got to remember that Jesus summed it up. Matthew seven twelve. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and prophets. And I know at first we read that and we're like, oh, that's too simple. But it's honestly not. Acting it out is complex and it's hard and it's challenging and it's frustrating And it puts us at risk where we have to be vulnerable. All these things we don't like. But I think if we're willing, yeah, let's dive in to that as a church. Let's dive in to Christ and have an imperfective view that allows us to see the trajectory of God's love for our here and now. Because that's what I pick up. I look at that teaching found in the Sermon on the Mount, and I look at Matthew 5, 17 to 20, and then the but I say after it, and I see Jesus is trying to show us something. All throughout that gospel, Matthew seems to paint a story where it's like Jesus is trying to take us on a journey. Come with me. Dive in deeper. Not just face value. There's more than you realize. There's more to do. And that's a lot harder for us to go on a journey. But I hope as a church we're willing to. I hope we're willing to dive in to Christ in a way that gives us uh, an imperfective view of the law. Where we dive in and see the heart of it. We see what the heart of it is so we can know what God might be calling us to do here and now. Because the world, it needs something different. And churches need to change. I'm included in that. But churches need to change, and we need to figure out what God's wanting us to do in our here and now. We need to figure out how to be more relevant in society. We need to figure out how to be a place that's loving and full of grace and mercy. We need to figure out how to be a place that stands up for the truths of God as well. That's all complex. And as churches, we often don't want to do all of that. We just pick a a portion and throw out the things we disagree with. But I pray as Highfields Church, and as we move into this amazing building and we have, you know, at the front, we want to be a welcoming place. I pray that we figure out what it means for us, what God's calling us to do. And we dive in deeper and deeper and deeper together. And I'll just close in prayer, and I think the worship team is going to come up and play one last song. God, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your teaching of the law. Thank you for how passionate Jesus was about the law. How he calls us to go deeper. He calls us to wrestle with it, to discover the heart of you in it, to discover your grace, which is within the law. Discover what you're calling us to do in our here and now. And I pray as a church that you'll help us be able to do that. You'll help us dive in. You'll help us be willing to get our hands messy and to wrestle with you. To figure what your heart behind it is and what you're calling us to do here and now in the community of Highfields. In your amazing name, amen.